Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community, and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So, no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So, welcome to church. Oh, 
child and Thou with me dwelling And I with Thee one Riches I heed not Nor man's empty My treasure thou art My King of heaven Thy victory won May I reach heaven's joys O bright heaven's sun Well, hello and welcome to our online service with North County Church. We're so glad you joined us. We're going to be continuing our series today in 1 Thessalonians, so I encourage you to turn there in your Bibles. And we're going to be looking at this church and seeing it the way Paul describes it as a model church. Why is it a model church? What does a model church look like? What makes it such? Well, we're going to find out in just a couple of moments. We're going to be reading beginning in chapter 1 at verse 4, where we left off last week. But I, I want to begin by describing something that happened to me recently where I heard a message that I have heard many times before. It's an old message. It's a potentially life-saving message. And yet the way it was being communicated and the way it was being received seemed out of sync with the things that were being said. The message is that old message that you've probably heard many times if you've flown on an airplane. It's the message that's given at the beginning of a flight where the flight attendant gets up and talks about taking the card out of the seat back pocket in front of you and finding the exits and talks about masks dropping down in the case of a loss of cabin pressure and about the seat being able to be used as a flotation device. And this particular flight attendant was giving the talk and it sounded like she had given the talk hundreds of times before, and there was no enthusiasm in her voice. It was kind of a dull monotone, but she was talking in a rather fast-paced dull monotone. And she probably realized that most of the people that were listening weren't very tuned in either. And as I looked around and looked at the way people were listening to this message, very few had taken the card out of the seat back in front of them. Most were scrolling through their phones, maybe going through social media one last time or sending that last text before they had to turn off their electronic device. There was no enthusiasm from the speaker or the receivers. And I thought, can it become that way for those of us who are Christians when we hear the message, if we've heard it so many times before, even if we've spoken it, so many times before. Is there a danger of it becoming routine, of us taking on an attitude that says, hey, been there, done that, heard that? I think it's possible. I think it happens. One of the reasons it's so invigorating to read a letter like First Corinthians or First Thessalonians is that these Christians have heard the gospel and it's fresh and it's new for them and they've received it and it has been absolutely life-changing because it is. They've given up their idols. They've come to God. They've turned their lives over to Him. And everything in their world has been turned upside down in the best of ways. They're saved from their lives of futility, living in idolatry. And now they have not only 
abundant life here, but they've got eternal life. And as we said last week, they're living impactful lives and they're anticipating the return of Jesus. The point is, this message that we have, this old gospel message, boy, it's powerful. It can change lives and it can change the lives of people in our community and we need to convey it well and we need to receive it well and we see a model of this among the Thessalonians. Heard a story recently, George Sweeting tells it in his book, No Guilt, The No Guilt Guide for Witnessing. He tells the story of a man named John Courier who way back in 1949 had been sentenced for the crime of murder. He'd been given a life sentence, but for some reason, years down the road, he was paroled and transferred to a working farm outside of Nashville, Tennessee. While he's there at that farm, he'd been working for a number of years. His sentence was terminated, and a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. But John never read the letter. He kept working on the farm. Maybe he hadn't opened it. Maybe he'd never seen it. He was never told anything about it. He just kept working on that farm, working that hard life with no promise whatsoever for the future. Well, 10 years went by, if you can imagine that. Then a state parole officer learned about Courier's plight. He found him and told him that his sentence had been terminated and that he was a free man. Can you imagine hearing that and hearing it 10 years late? Well, Sweeting concluded that story by asking the question, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message, the most important message in your life, and year after year the urgent message was never delivered? Or we might say never received? The gospel, the word of God, is the life-changing message that sets us free, that gives us eternal life. And you may have this letter, so to say, sitting on a shelf, and maybe you rarely open it. Or you have it, and maybe you never share it and never deliver it to those who need to hear it. We're going to read 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 through 10 in just a couple of moments. And what we find here in this particular section of Scripture is the hopeful progression of the gospel. Because what we see in the Thessalonians is how they received the word, what they did with it, how they let it work in them, and then how they passed it on. Uh, this hopeful progression of the gospel in our life is that it comes to us, works in us, and then hopefully it flows out from us. That's what happened in their case. So let's go ahead and read, beginning in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. We're going to start at verse 4 and read down to verse 10. For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that God has chosen you, because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and deep conviction. You know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has become known everywhere. Therefore, we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves report what kind of a reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. So, we've talked in our introduction about this church, how it came about, how it was opposed, how Paul's time there was cut short. But he and his co-workers had left behind a church that had become vibrant and alive. And this letter may have been written about a year after the church had gotten its start. 
I don't know if you've ever heard this, but I've heard it said that a church's most exciting years are in the first 10 years of their existence. There's a freshness. There's a focus. There's a, a willingness to sacrifice. People are willing to surrender their time and resources to build that church up. But then, the progression tends to be, then it goes into a period of stagnation and atrophy and maybe even decline. Maybe you've heard the old saying that when it comes to churches, uh, they start with a man, they become a movement, and then they become a monument. And what that basically means is here's an individual or here's maybe a small group of people. And with a fire, they go and start a church and they're excited and enthused and they want to reach that community. Uh, maybe it's a small group of people. But boy, they're on mission. And after they get started, things begin to gain momentum and it becomes a movement. Lives are being changed. People are giving their lives to Christ and being baptized. And then after a period of time, slowly atrophy starts to set in. They settle and they stagnate and then they begin to slowly decline. Does it have to be that way? I don't believe that it does. How do we avoid that happening? How do we stop that? Well, we stop that by making the gospel our gospel and letting that gospel flow from us, flow out of us. And as we see others' lives continue to change, it reignites that fire in our own lives. Well, I want you to think about that hopeful progression of the gospel. I want you to think about our church. I want you to think about our setting as we look at these Thessalonians and as we draw some applications. So when we talk about the gospel, the gospel is received and then it redirects and then the gospel rings out. That's the hopeful progression. It's received. It redirects our lives, and then it rings out. Let's look at the first of these. The first part of this is when we think of the gospel, we receive it. How did they receive it? What did they let it accomplish in their life? Well, at verse 5, Paul said, Our gospel came to you, not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep Conviction. So I want you to think about that for a couple of moments. The gospel did not come to you only or simply with words, not just with words. The Holy Spirit's power accompanied their preaching. When you read the accounts in Acts chapter 17, we don't read about spectacular miracles being performed in Thessalonica. They certainly may have been present. The Holy Spirit's role is not simply in producing miracles and making them happen. The Holy Spirit empowered their preaching. It worked on the hearts of those that were hearing. Paul said in Romans chapter 1 at verse 16 that the gospel has the power to bring salvation to people's lives. So there's a power that accompanies the word. There was also deep conviction. Deep conviction in these whose lives were changed and deep conviction by those who proclaimed the message. They were convicted, the receivers, but the ones presenting it, presented it with a conviction. There's a passion and an intensity in their presenting the gospel. And then they experienced power. I mean, power was seen in the fact that the synagogue worshiping Jews were led to Christ and that a new church was formed, made up of these and a whole lot of former idolaters. Boy, that takes power. I mean, God was accomplishing in Thessalonica what could never be replicated in any other way as the gospel came into that particular city. So let me ask you, let me ask you, as you read things like this, do you ever read these accounts and long to see them happen again in our age, 
in our day in the North County of San Diego. Here's what you and I need to understand. Listen, we lack nothing needed to see the same things today as they saw then. The gospel lacks none of the power today that it had back then. It is every bit as powerful. And I sometimes wonder that if we would refer, as Paul and Silas and Timothy did, to our gospel rather than the gospel, perhaps we'd start to embrace the fact that it's as good for us and it's as good for the people around us as it was for them. This is our good news. We've received it and embraced it and it's changed our lives and with deep conviction, we should want to share it with others. And when we do, the gospel has as much power as it ever had. It can impact cities and places today in the way it did Thessalonica. Do you believe that? Now, notice it may not have gone out with words alone, but it did come with words, and that's critical. The gospel always needs to be shared verbally. The gospel itself needs to be spoken for people to come to Christ. This is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.21, it pleased God through the foolishness of the message that was preached to save those who believe. And then in Romans 10.14, you might remember Paul saying, how can they believe in the one in whom they've not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? So the word needs to be spoken. Even though Paul said it didn't come simply with words, it was spoken in words. The message came to the Thessalonians through the lips of those who spoke it to them. But it also came through the life, both working together. It came in word, but not in word only. Notice what it says at verse 5. For you know how we lived among you for your sake. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. The message and the messenger had a consistency about them, about their lives. The testimony of their lives backed up the message from their lips. Word and example, these work together. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It just means you have to be changed as a result of your salvation. There's an old saying that goes, people will follow your footsteps quicker than they will follow your advice. So, we need to witness with our lips. We need to speak the word, and we need to bear witness with our lives, just like Paul and Timothy and Silas did as well. They back their words with the way that they conducted themselves. Now, I want you to think about this. If you just bring the gospel with your lips, but not your lives, that's hypocrisy. But if you just try to bring people to Christ with your lives, that's cruelty. Having said what I just said, people often say, you know, I'm not going to say anything about my faith. I'm just going to try to live a good life around people. I'm just going to let my example speak for me and speak for my faith. I'm just going to live a good Christian life, and by the way I live, people will see Christ in me. I'm not going to necessarily speak about Jesus or share the gospel with my lips. Well, that's a little bit like having discovered that a doctor has a cure for a previously incurable disease, and you had it and received the cure, and yet you refuse to tell others who have the disease how you got cured and where to get the cure. You say, you know, I'm just going to live a healthy life in front of them. I'm going to model good health before these good folks, and they're going to they're gonna see, and from the power of my health, know something about the cure that I've received. No, 
doesn't work that way. We've received the greatest cure, and we can live a life honorably in front of people that need to do that, but it needs both our life and our lips. The way we live and our sharing the gospel, it needs to come from both. So Paul said, we brought this message and we lived a certain way among you, and boy, how you received that message. These people, they were listening. They were ready. He said to them, you welcomed the message in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. Everyone who hears the message has to make a decision about what to do with the message. The church can offer the message. We Christians can share the message in the same way described here, but you still have to decide, what am I going to do with the message that I've received? And maybe you're watching this today, and maybe you've been searching or seeking, or maybe you're watching and, and you have been kind of away from your Christian faith, and you're hearing this, and it's a bit convicting. Well, conviction alone isn't enough. What are you going to do with the message? How will you receive it? These people welcomed it, and they received it with the joy given by the Holy Spirit, and they did it in the midst of severe suffering. It cost them something to both welcome and receive the message. So this is the first part, the hopeful progression. The message is received by us. And then how did they respond? What did it do in them? When we receive the gospel, it then redirects our life. We need to respond to it. And how do we respond to it? Well, we could reject it. But if we respond to it in the way God is hoping that we'll respond to it, the first way we respond to it is by conversion. It produces repentance. Paul said, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Repentance, repentance is a word that means to turn. It means to change. And for them, it was turning from unbelief and idolatry to serve the living and true God. And for us, it's turning from unbelief and from sin and the things that we formerly lived for and the idols that we once worshipped in order to serve the living and true God. That's a change of life. It's a redirection of our life. You turn from what displeases the Lord, and you now start serving the living God. I heard about a fellow by the name of Patrick Reynolds. He's an activist for the American Lung Association. And he goes out speaking a message urging people not to smoke. Now, what's interesting about Patrick Reynolds is that he is the grandson of R.J. Reynolds of the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company. He left the family business, doesn't collect any money whatsoever from the business, speaks as an anti-smoking activist. Why? Here he's turned his back on all that wealth, all that that would provide. Why? Because smoking killed his father, and in his words, he wants to make up for all the damage his family has done. Well, in a real sense, that's repentance. He has turned his back on all that money, all that opportunity to be wealthy, to speak a message of conviction that could extend people's life, to turn people away from something that destroys them and could end their life early. So that's a pretty good example of repentance. There is nothing so exciting than to see true conversion. The most exciting place to be is at a water body where people confess their faith, confessing Jesus as Lord and are dying to their old lives and being raised to the new life in baptism. So, how do we receive it? How do we respond to it? Conversion. And then you'll notice anticipation. It produced in them an anticipation. At verse 10, Paul said, not only did they 
leave their old idols to serve the living and true God, but also to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead. So now there's this anticipation. When people come to know and love Jesus, the next thing they want to do is see him. And when they hear the promise that he's coming back, there's this anticipation that wells up inside of them, that he's coming again, and that every eye will see him. Now, if you're not a believer, that's not an exciting proposition because Paul teaches that although he's bringing salvation for believers, he's bringing wrath as well. Paul also says at verse 10 that he rescues us from the coming wrath. So there is this great day coming when Jesus comes again, and for the believer now, he lives in anticipation of that day as we spoke last week that Christ is coming again. And then there's submission. Submission. Paul goes on and he says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. In other words, you received this gospel, you were converted in your heart, you turned from your old idols to serve the living and true God. You're living in anticipation of the Lord's return And now you're learning what it is to be like Christ. You're submitting your life to His. You're experiencing change. You're being transformed. And one of the ways you're doing that, not only is the Word working in your heart, but you've seen the way we live our lives, and you are becoming imitators of us and of the Lord. Over to the Corinthians, Paul said to them, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. People need mentors in the faith. People become disciples, not just by receiving new teaching, but by seeing how others live it out in their life. We need more and more people who can be mentors to others in the faith. We hear it, we see it, and our goal is to become like the Lord. So again, here's this hopeful progression. The word is received. We respond to it. And then notice what the Thessalonians did. The gospel then rings out from them, and it rings out from us. They couldn't keep it in. Once this message had changed their lives, they had to share it with everybody. They were a little bit like the apostles in the book of Acts. They couldn't help but speak about the things of which they had seen and heard. And that was true of the Thessalonians. Here's what Paul said. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith has been or become known everywhere. That word, ring out, that phrase, also is read in some translations, sound forth. It means to echo or to reverberate forth. It's the sound of a trumpet making sure that it's heard. It is a loud, unmistakable proclamation. So they were a saved church wanting to see more people get saved. They didn't say, hey, we've got ours. Hey, you all fend for yourselves, but but you know, we got our share of the gospel. No, they received it. They let it work in their life. It changed everything about them, and then it rang out from them. You know, there are several ways that believers can respond to the world around them, and I've seen each of these. Some may isolate. You know, they, they have the gospel, they're Christians, and, and it's about me and my own. We're going to kind of keep sheltered. I'm going to kind of protect my kids and my family from that world out there. And they just kind of isolate. Maybe they show up for church but they don't get too plugged in. You know, some of those other church folks' families may not have it together like our family does, and and they might influence our kids, and so they isolate. Others may insulate. They may say, now that they're a Christian, hey, I really don't want to get engaged with anything that's going on in the world out there. I don't want to know even much of what's going on out there in the world. I'm just going to kind of insulate myself. Maybe just have Christians around me all the time. You know, they'll go to church events. They'll go to worship. They'll go to small groups. They'll get involved in church activities, but they never engage anybody outside of the church, and they have very few relationships with people 
outside of the church. They kind of insulate themselves from the world that's around them. And then a third response is to imitate, imitate the world. There are some who have this kind of attitude, hey, the only way for me to get them to like me and hear me is if I'm like them. I won't live that different. I won't look that different. Hey, you know, if they think I'm cool, then I can maybe say something for them for the gospel. And so they just become like the world around them, and the gospel really hasn't changed their lives. None of these are ways to live lives of impact. This church did none of those things. Paul said about them in verse 7, you have become a model to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. Why? Because the message rang out from them. They couldn't hold it in, and when it rings out from us, it spills out and starts to change people around us. Others have the same opportunity they had to receive it, to respond to it, to let it change their lives, and then to share it with others. This is a model church, a model church for a whole lot of reasons. They were a model in how they received the word, how they responded to the word, how they let the message and the word ring out from them. I think it can also be said that they were a model of earnestness. I mean, they turned from their idols to serve the living God. They were a model of joyful endurance. They welcomed the message, Paul said, in the midst of severe suffering with the joy given by the Holy Spirit. They were a model of expectancy. They lived in anticipation of one day meeting Jesus face to face, and it shaped the way they lived their lives in the now, and they wanted to help as many people prepare for that day as they possibly could. And they're a model of evangelism. Folks, we don't want the church to become a monument of what was. We want to be a model of what can be so that others might be inspired. Let's let the Thessalonian church inspire us. We'll be back next week with another message and we'll get into chapter two together. Pray about this passage this week. Mull it over and share what we have with other people. We're gonna meet this evening, four o'clock, Grape Day Park in Escondido. We're going to continue the series on who is God. God is holy. Be a time of worship and praise. Bring a chair. Bring a mask. Bring your Bible. Bring a friend. And join us for a socially distanced worship outdoors. Uh, again, at Grape Day Park in Escondido. Have a blessed day today. Join us again next week as we continue our First Thessalonians series.